Ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, if I could ask for your attention, uh, give me the privilege to introduce our next speaker, His Excellency Ambassador Ilir Dugoli, Ambassador of Kosovo to Belgium. His Excellency Ambassador Dugoli holds a law degree from the University of Pristina and an LLM in Comparative Constitutional Law from Central European University. In 2002, he served as adjunct professor at Arizona State University in the United States. He is also the co-founder of the Kosovar Institute for Policy Research and Development, so initially an academic. But it doesn't stop there. From 2002 until 2004, Ambassador Dugoli was senior advisor to the Prime Minister of Kosovo. He was also advisor to the commander of the Kosovo Protection Corps from 2005 until 2006. Ambassador Dugoli was a member of the Council of the Independent Media Commission from 2006 until 2007. He was a lecturer in the Political Science and Public Administration Departments of the University of Pristina from 2003 until 2004, at the Law School of the University of Pristina from 2001 until 2008, and the American University of Kosovo in 2007. From 2008 until 2009, he served as the Chargé d'Affaires of the Embassy of the Republic of Kosovo in Brussels, and was one of the key figures responsible for actually establishing the embassy. And so in that sense, he has a very I think, personal relationship in Brussels, having actually really set up this institution, which he is now leading. Uh, he has been the Kosovo ambassador to Brussels since 2009. The lecture topic that he has chosen uh, is also a very interesting one. Let me make sure that I read it correctly. Uh, yes, here it is. The obvious case of cultural diplomacy, question mark. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for His Excellency, Ambassador Idir Dugoli. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mark, uh, and thank you very much to the Institute for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, for a number of reasons. I don't have to enumerate maybe all of them, but uh, uh, you don't get so often an opportunity to uh, get away from a uh, regular schedule of ambassadors, and that is not really kind of a schedule that many of you may envision. It's similar to uh, often kind of a travel agency type of activity rather than receptions and the other things that you may have in your minds. Uh, but seriously, I'm, it's a real pleasure also to, 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 to address a group of young people uh, like you here and to try to share some opinions with you on the topic chosen. Um, of course, not least, it's always good to be at the European Parliament to have a chance to speak. I mean, I don't get that that often. Usually, we are sitting on the other side. Uh, so, to start from the title uh, itself, I mean, the role, the uh, way, the importance of cultural diplomacy is, I think, as obvious as it can be. It really does not take too much persuasive power and arguments and need to convince somebody on the weight and importance of uh, utilizing culture as a tool to not only foster your own interest or foster uh, interest of one country, but also to bridge divides between different uh, entities, between different uh, countries, institutions, or cultures in general. Particularly being here, I mean, at the event organized by the uh, Institute on Cultural uh, Diplomacy, uh, talking in favor of cultural diplomacy is kind of preaching to the converted. Uh, so it would not need to elaborate much in that favor. Uh, it is a self-evident fact. It is obvious. Uh, but having said that, I mean, self-evident facts and obvious facts are nonetheless a very suitable territory for diplomats. Uh, it's a territory where we feel comfortable and uh, that we don't like very much to abandon. Uh, in fact, we are trained to think much more inside of the box rather than outside of the box. I mean, we are paid to stick to policy guidelines of our bosses uh, rather than abandon them. And we are actually expected to uh, amplify those policy guidelines as much as possible. And as every amplificator, as, as every uh, uh, kind of echo, it may continue even when the original sound has ceased to exist. So it's not seldom that you find diplomats almost in a comical situation of saying something and arguing in favor of something while well, the message, the original message, has ceased to be transmitted. Uh, for the sake of illustration, this spring, 
It has occurred more than once with colleagues from different countries of um, where where Arab Spring has 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 kind of had an effect uh, to talk, to debate, and to see how professional they try to do and to stick to the policy guidelines, and then a month later to have completely different attitude and enthusiasm with what has taken place in their own countries. So, had I not been a diplomat, of course, I would have chosen much more controversial topic. Uh, I would have maybe approached this issue from a very provocative point of view. I would have had maybe more bold statements and things to say. Um, who knows, something completely opposite maybe, like the obscure case of of, of cultural diplomacy, and then trying to argue and to question actually the rationale, the existence, the value of cultural diplomacy as such. But I'm not there, so I'm here at the capacity of the diplomat, and for whatever it's worth, I'll try just to share some of my views uh, with you in full, in honest manner, as I say, for whatever they are worth it. Uh, and in doing that, I will try to kind of answer twofold that question made of two parts. One is kind of why cultural diplomacy? What is it in it? Uh, what value do we get and what kind of benefits do we get from that? Uh, this is kind of a cultural diplomacy in the most general sense of the word. And then I place the kind of second part of the question to me, say it's just more specific aspect of, uh, of, of a case for cul cultural diplomacy, more specific in the sense of whether there is value in it, whether there is possibility to utilize it for uh, new, not so affluent, small countries like mine, for countries where one does not think immediately of culture when you talk about them, uh, that you do not usually associate uh, with, with, uh, with elements of culture in general or cultural diplomacy. And in both these parts of a general question, my very clear, unambiguous answer is yes. I mean, absolutely yes. There is a case, and there is a case in this general case for cultural diplomacy. And then there is, I believe, also a case, even when it's not so obvious, for countries newly established, small, not so affluent, with limited resources and possibilities. In both these different facets of the same question, the answer is, Clearly, yes. But it wouldn't be then sufficient just to say yes and leave it, put into a service uh, to this uh, session. So let me share a few thoughts to back this opinion of mine. And the points that I will share are complete kind of combination of experiences from general sense of where this case of cultural diplomacy stands and some lessons from my own case or the case of my country, so to say. So in a combined form, I will share just few arguments, few reasons why the case for cultural diplomacy is strong, and there is no need for that question mark other than to have a nice, maybe an entertaining debate here among us. First, I mean, we are facing nowadays a plethora of tools that are available in conducting diplomacy. We cannot rest in one sole or two sole means to foster our own ideas, interests in a world that has become very complex, very dynamic and interdependent. So no country, whether it be very strong or entities in general, can rely on a single tool to promote interest, to promote themselves or to clarify their own point of view. So with this kind of plethora of tools in place, cultural diplomacy has a significant role. And it has also because, aside from this proliferation of different tools, I believe that the context in which the diplomacy of, is conducted has also changed. And this may be even more important than the fact that we have now more and more tools available. And the context is following that now win-win solutions in negotiating and trying to conduct diplomacy are not only the optimal ones, but very often are actually imposing themselves as a, as a must. Otherwise, they backfire. Uh, results kind of backfire in longer term. What I mean with this, take the example of, I don't know, Greece and so on. For a typical diplomat from Greece, years ago when entering the Eurozone, it would have been maybe smart, clever to outsmart the other, to present the facts as they were suitable to, to them and to join the Eurozone. 
But later on, you see that that badly backfires. And in fact, if it wasn't a win-win from the very beginning, uh, it will be a lose-lose, and there cannot be no, no, no other option. So in this sense, with kind of proliferation of different tools and also with a change of context, the cultural diplomacy has a particular weight because from what I know about it, it is one of the most suitable instruments that makes us aware of the other, that opens up to understanding of the other, and that kind of paves the way to, to, to foster much more understanding rather than just reaching a certain result, than just reaching a certain solution. And when that kind of understanding is there, when it is well placed and when it is uh, adequately utilized, then you are kind of much more prone to reach to these sort of win-win solutions rather than outsmart the other and then have a solution that will backfire you further along the road. So this would be kind of a, the first reason, the changing of the, of the tools that are available, the, the plethora of those tools that are, and kind of change of, of, uh, of the context as well. The second very obvious that comes kind of from experience that Mark was talking about uh, when, when we uh, mentioned the fact of having established the embassy and so on and so forth. In minds of all of our colleagues who have went through this, whether in recent years or from other countries in uh, five years or ten years ago, or it doesn't matter, but countries who are new, who are small with limited resources and capacities do not have the backbone of a strong Ministry of Foreign Affairs back home to, with all the dusty and heavy files to look at. Uh, so they really need to use every single opportunity possible. They need to utilize whatever there is there available. And one of the most suitable tools, again, is kind of outside the scope of classical uh, diplomacy that is conducted by institutions only and that is conducted only in, the, so to say, traditional course, core uh, mechanisms of, of diplomacy. So for a, small, for a small country, for a new country, for a country with limited resources, one of the best ways to make your case, to present your argument, is actually by utilizing cultural diplomacy. Third, that I believe is an extreme important argument in its favor is kind of creativity. Uh, you don't have to be John Stuart Mill to uh, realize that from freedom of thought and freedom of speech and so on, some of the best ideas and actually the development of the entire society rests. And to refer to the joke I was trying to make earlier of, 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 of us being trained to think inside the box, uh, with other tools, with tools that cultural diplomacy provides, you have the best means possible to think outside of the box. Um, there's a scene from Yes Prime Minister, for those who might have looked or be aware of this, this, this uh, famous uh, serial of, uh, of, of, of British production, uh, where Prime Minister of Britain having come back from his trip to US uh, talks about how he, uh, how he meet, how his meeting basically went, and then he 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 he, he goes on to elaborate how he started by uh, reading from his talking points, and then the president of U.S. also read from his talking points, and then he continued to read from his talking points, and back and forth, and then he says, well, at some point we just decided to swap our talking points because there was no point in in, in going on in reading us our, my myself my talking points and he himself his talking points. And then we continue talking about other issues. So with us diplomats, very often you can predict uh, what our talking points will be. I mean, you can mention any of the issues that is uh, in today's agenda, in our particular case or in other countries, uh, some of the burning issues. And yes, there are guidelines and there is a more or less an expectation of what you can say. And that's the way it has been. That's the way it's going to be most probably for a long time. But nonetheless, for the sake of this kind of development generated by creativity, by uh, inventiveness and so on, you need to utilize whatever else you have uh, in order to bring 
on the table better ideas, to bring on the table kind of good, positive uh, ideas, maybe negative ideas, but out of those, some, of, some will certainly be kind of positive. So from this point of view of also, let's say, creativity, I find this an extremely significant and useful tool. Uh, another element, again, coming back from the region that I uh, am, and uh, we are marred very often by image problems. An image in diplomacy in general matters significantly. Um, one thing is connected to the other. You try to, for, to, to foster economic development and people tell you, well, you need uh, more foreign direct investments. You try to attract the investments and they say, well, yes, but you need to strengthen the rule of law. And then you work on the rule of law, but they say, how can your rule of law function if your image is already so bad? And then with a situation of that kind, you uh, may be cynical and think, how much you can rely on politicians solely, who very often are the reason for that kind of image, to improve the image that is created. Uh, you ca can have that cynical reason, or you can have even, if you are more practical, and say, well, politicians, even if they are the best possible, nonetheless, in their case, uh, they are going to be seen as politicians, they, they are going to be expected to say certain things. But when you have I don't know, uh, artists, when you have uh, dancers, when you have, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, painters, uh, artists of all kinds, uh, they bring uh, views, concerns, issues, um, and remain, remove those uh, barriers that exist and improve image considerably because in their meetings they are an artist to an artist, much more than a representative of one country, a diplomat representing, I don't know, uh, Kosovo talking to a diplomat representing Lithuania or, or, or any other, other, other combination. So in that sense of, of kind of significant weight that image has, cultural diplomacy has a case and is a strong tool to be utilized as much as possible. If for nothing else, then for the reason that you have artists having kind of more or less their own community and considering themselves as as, as, as equals, or if not as equals, then just judging themselves, judging uh, themselves or each other based on the on the on the work that one does, instead of um, the, the the citizenship and the passport that one holds. Uh, so you need to really utilize as much as possible that tool as well in order to change the image, to improve it, or to present it the way that you think should be when it is uh, marred, when it is. Uh, consequence of whatever conflicts that you went through, uh, um, legacy that you are uh, carrying over your shoulders, and so on and so forth. And there are clearly a number of different other reasons, but there is one that, in my opinion, also matters and is worthwhile mentioning uh, here in this forum. That is the fact that, again, connected with, with, with let's say, predictability of our talking points. With tools of cultural diplomacy, you can make your point across in a more subtle way, so to say. Uh, you can transmit it uh, in a more um, sophisticated manner. Uh, and, not necessarily sophisticated actually, sometimes you can transmit it in a very raw and brutal manner. Uh, it is there as your concern, your uh, issue, your uh, grievance, whatever that may be, your interest maybe, but it doesn't have to be packaged in a nice uh, diplomatic language that maybe sometimes doesn't mean nothing. In other words, example of the exhibition that uh, uh, my colleague who is there worked hard to organize last year, uh, dealing with visa issues. That is a big matter for us, Kosovo being the only country still who has to travel with visas in Europe. And you know, whenever we have ministers here, whenever we have representatives, whenever we have others, they have their own talking points, they have their own materials, they have their own background papers, they present them, they make a case of what has been done and why these measures need to be taken by the other side, by EU, so that we are also involved and eventually our citizens should be able to travel freely. But 
for our interlocutors, very often they know that they will expect that and they have their own counter arguments and they will present. And this process will, of course, go on for years until we come to a point that we convince each other that we should move to the next stage. But the value of using tools, the plethora of tools of cultural diplomacy that's on there, an illustration of that, that, that uh, exhibition that I mentioned is that you can have a simple artist making point from a basic human point of view of this is our concern. You can have a dash there in a, in a, in a corridor symbolizing a river where people uh, die trying to cross illegally. Uh, the, the, it is stripped of any, let's say, legal, political, and other concerns. It brings us back to basic, so to say, almost as human, but an issue that exists. Uh, and they don't argue in legal terms, they don't argue in political terms, they don't care if something is not being done for their own government or some other institutions or the reason is inside or outside and so on. Uh, as, and I talk now about artists in particular, but I think that applies for any form of, of cultural diplomacy. They bring these sorts of issues back to basic. They make them very raw, very direct, very brutal, if you want, in a manner that none of us can make that. So these are some of the uh, reasons, really, why I think that the case for cultural diplomacy is extremely strong, is very strong, and one needs to use it as much as possible, whenever possible, and, um, of course, to the best of the possibilities that there exist. But the, 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 is it, let's say, then, if it's so suitable, so adequate, and all those reasons exist for it to be utilized, uh, substitute for all other tools of, of conducting diplomacy? I mean, certainly not. Uh, I wouldn't say so. I don't believe so. And I don't think that anybody is saying so. Uh, but it is also just a mere complementary tool. I, again, don't think so. I think it's much more than that. Uh, it is much more than that in that sense of the push of the, that it gives, of the uh, compelling weight that it puts on our shoulder to understand the other, uh, to try to understand the other, and to try to have these sort of if I can say, kind of win-win situations as much as possible. Um, what I mean, if I may elaborate a few more words with this, is that when you conduct, I don't know, um, um, typical traditional forms of diplomacy, you are very often, as in a race, trying to compete and to reach certain destination. Uh, but in that race, yes, you may succeed and you may reach that destination. And uh, if you reach, fair enough, but along the way you may also uh, maybe do all sorts of, 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 of damages. And with cultural diplomacy in place, you try not only to compete and to race, but you try to, by understanding the other, uh, to bridge the divide and to realize that maybe, you know, the interest of the other is actually your interest as well, or vice versa, that your interest is uh, also the other people's, parties, countries, whatever, interest, and so on. And in that, I recall kind of uh, a, a definition uh, uh, that, that of, of driving that Woody Allen would give, and that very often reminds me of of, of traditional, if I may say, of classical diplomacy. If we kind of compete with each other so badly, then we lose, we lose sight of uh, what we are basically doing and in trying to reach the goal, in trying to reach the destination, uh, not only you may badly harm the other, but you may badly harm yourself. And what Woody Allen would say about dangerous driving, I mean, his definition that I think to a certain extent may apply to sometimes traditional forms of diplomacy is that dangerous driver, basically, you say, is the one who is doing everything possible to overpass you while you are doing everything possible trying to stop him. And, I mean, you have to face it. Whether you are a diplomat or just a driver, you have found yourself in that kind of situation when somebody tries to overpass you and you, instead of, you know, um, um, pushing the brake, you are doing the opposite. You are trying to prevent him from from overpassing you just to discipline or to reach your own goal. Uh, 
this is, this is, I believe, kind of, if I may say, uh, the situation and some of the basic arguments that I have uh, in favor of cultural diplomacy. As I said initially, I mean, to a venue of this nature and to, 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 to uh, an event organized by the institute that um, on its own name holds proudly a label of cultural diplomacy is preaching to the converted. But nonetheless, I wanted in full honesty to share few thoughts, few observations uh, of, in a sense, an outsider, of a person who is not on day-to-day -day basis involved like you of studying this, of analyzing it, but who actually cannot even afford a luxury very often to think about this because you just have to do your own business. You just have to do your own job and you cannot reflect that much of, okay, what would be better in a big picture to utilize whether we do this or that. You just have to go with the flow and you have to do and you have to arrange uh, a, a visit or work on an agreement or do things of that nature. So with that note, I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity that made me reflect a bit about this issue. Uh, and I'm not sure what the format is, but in case that there is any question, any comment, uh, I would gladly uh, take and try to respond uh, to the best of my knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. And we certainly would like to take some questions and comments. I think the first one I'll give to my colleague, Darnell. And then please, uh, any questions or comments? Yeah, well, thank you for your um, presentation. I'm sitting here trying to formulate my answer. I mean, my question, rather, and you were saying so many interesting things that you couldn't really get it together. But uh, I'm confronted with, uh, with the Roma population from Romania. I live in Germany every day in one way or another. In fact, there's a, a troop of musicians who come and play under my window uh, from time to time. Uh, there was a statement made by uh, the last presenter about the contributions that the Roma Sinti uh, people have made to music, to art, to culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just started contemplating that. And I was just wondering, you know, are there any monuments or special places of recognition in anywhere in Europe that, you know, kind of like outline or uh, underline the contribution that Roma people have made to culture? And wouldn't that necessarily be a way to uh, explain their plight, explain their situation in, in European society? Thank you. The, uh, is there room, is there place, is there um, rationale for such a monument? I absolutely believe so. Uh, you see, the, the, the tragedy of Roma, uh, wherever you look, is so um, clear and so um, harsh uh, that um, a monument to their, uh, let's say, contribution, as you have said, um, would, of course, do justice, if for nothing else, than to kind of suffering that they have uh, experience in all uh, different parts of Europe and in different uh, parts of history. Uh, so would, whether it would be, let's say, uh, suitable and well-placed, I certainly think so, uh, absolutely. Uh, but I think also that, in full honesty, that the real kind of monument uh, for them are themselves, and one should really treat them respectfully and try to uh, provide them opportunities to uh, preserve their culture, uh, to move freely, uh, to live freely, and to have opportunities like everybody else has. Uh, I mean, in our region, uh, they had had their part of suffering, no doubt about that. Uh, and they found themselves at, let's say, receiving end during the, during the conflict and during the war. But I'm also proud to say that, for example, just a week ago, uh, here in this parliament, there were their representative together with other representatives who sit in our parliament and who were meeting with members of the European Parliament. And, you know, to have a representative of Roma sitting in Kosovo's parliament and then come here and meet with the other parliamentarians is kind of a monument, a living monument to themselves, I think. It tells about their fighting, struggling, but also integrating and living in a society that faces so many different challenges, but they want to be part of those challenges and they want to uh, share the fate 
of the majority. That's what matters. Uh, previously, plus, uh, I mean, and actually now we got it again. Uh, they re reestablished a program in a public uh, TV uh, in Roma language. So this is when talking with people from other countries, uh, with Roma from other countries, they really mentioned it as a as an example that is unseen in other more advanced societies. Um, we had schools and we work intensively in having, you know, the elementary education and uh, some of the first books were actually printed uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in our country, uh, in our region at that time, uh, in Roma language. And that is another topic, particular topic uh, that one needs to discuss. So for me, in full honesty, I mean, I believe that, yes, there is a kind of place for this kind of typical uh, monument in a real sense of the word, but also there is a place for, let's say, metaphoric monument in investing, protecting, and enabling them to preserve their culture first and foremost. Thank you very much. I would like to have a, an idea of what the situation of Kosovo is nowadays um, after the conflict in the Balkans and uh, um, if you still have passports of the UN, if the UN presence is still there with the blue helmets, um, if the rule of law has been implemented, I would like to know more or less the situation. I know that you've been recognized um, your independence and I congratulate you for that and uh, also I'd like to express my solidarity because I've uh, had the opportunity to meet various people of, uh, from Kosovo and I have a highly opinion of them, very uh, well educated, hard workers and I really wish you the best. But I'd like to have an insight on the situation and uh, if you have any, if you can share your experience of how uh, the implementation of um, the changes after the conflict and uh, if it was, I, I know it was very, very hard, and you know everybody worked. I mean, me too, and everybody worked there. Uh, I'd like to know, from your point of, from point of view, mm, what lessons can we draw from that, and uh, what are the perspectives for for Kosovo? Thank you. I had a one whole lecture um, to try and dwell on issues like that, but uh, I'm sure that we don't have that much time, and it wouldn't be fair. Um, to keep you here and to stay talking about Kosovo and all the issues. I mean, if there is, let's say, rule of law and what has been done and so on. Uh, I mean, I'll try to maybe approach it this way, uh, talking about the conflict in the minds and the, from the way that you pose the question in the minds of most of the people who actually pose those kinds of questions. Usually it is, you know, the war, 98, 99, and that's it. Um, our tragedy has been that the conflict has lasted a lot and it has started in 89 uh, when us who were then studying and so on were actually prevented from even going uh, in our own schools and studying our own language in our mother tongue. Uh, so basically, I mean, um, and some of us have studied in those circumstances, I mean, enrolled and graduated in those underground uh, circumstances and those underground universities just because we didn't want to abandon something that we had until now and that we thought that it is just. I mean, it is as simple as that. So that has lasted. Of course, the legacy out of those uh, difficulties uh, is, is vivid, no doubt about that. But at the same time, we have really done a lot. Uh, UN has played a considerable role there uh, with establishing its presence in 99 and follow up to the intervention uh, in, in, in then uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. And uh, with the declaration of our independence in 2008, of course, we are now an independent country. Uh, UN, there are no UN soldiers uh, of that kind. Uh, there is NATO presence still, which is downsizing, and that is currently at the range of 5,000, but that is constantly uh, going down based on the normalizations of circumstances. They are, of course, local institutions. Uh, we fight, of course, more and more every day for recognitions. Uh, and we have, you know, our case was disputed by uh, Serbia, the International Court of Justice, who gave a very clear opinion last year that our independence is in full compliance of international law. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, we exist, we are an independent country that do face a number of challenges internationally uh, due to blockade from Serbia. But nonetheless, there is also a process which is led by EU trying to make both these countries normalize relations before they join the EU. That is maybe advantage in this instance that us, that Serbia, that EU all together have, 
that is aspiration to join EU and EU doesn't want problems in. So the situation is very clear. Sooner or later you need to have good neighborly relations. So the, 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 the statement is there already clear. I mean, you are neighbors and you need to live as neighbors and you cannot block or undermine each other. Uh, so that is the situation. I mean, when it comes to rule of law, of course, a lot, a lot has been done. We need to, needed to build a um, justice system from scratch and to establish police. Police is considered, for example, as one of the best in the region. And uh, um, EU has helped in that, NATO, has, uh, uh, UN has helped in that as well. Uh, but there are different pieces of the whole puzzle that needs to be established. When compared to where we were, I mean, changes are um, incredible. Uh, I mentioned this illustration, for example, but really, when, when, I, when I see people here coming from all communities, uh, representing Kosovo and talking with MEPs and others and so on and so forth, when I see how well 10 years after the war uh, even serves, I mean serves because this is the minority that we had a bit of issues with, uh, have integrated in the south of our countries with newly established municipalities, that gives hope that the same can happen also in the north of our country when there are tensions with, uh, with, our, with, uh, with our neighbors, uh, northern neighbors with Serbia. Uh, so. In one sentence, I really I don't know how I would describe, uh, let's say, the situation. We are hopeful, we are optimistic, we uh, may be critical and pessimistic and complain about many different things. I find this with my friends when I go back home, uh, it's usually like that. But then comes a point when just one of those may mention, well, do you remember that 10 years ago I was in this refugee camp or I was there or I was there? And that that kind of brings you back to, to reality and to the level that you appreciate much more what you have. I think that we have considerable things to appreciate that we need to build. Uh, we also try to be very critical towards ourselves and to um, work and to improve things because there are so many uh, that need to be and the list is very, very long. Uh, but you try to, I mean, deal, uh, deal with them one at a time or in parallel depending how how, what would be the best way to manage that. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Nicolescu. Uh, I'm from a country that is still to recognize Kosovo, uh, and that is Romania. And when we had a national debate about it, or when there was a lot of media coverage about it, the main idea, the main uh, reason for Romania not recognizing Kosovo was preventing ethnic separatist movements. Uh, do you feel that these fears are rational in countries that are yet to recognize Kosovo? And how do you, uh, what, uh, you as a diplomat, what kind of relations can you have with diplomats from countries you, that have not recognized you, and what can you do about it? <coughs> and then we could. Bonjour, Messi Fellow at Johns Hopkins University. First of all, I would like to thank you so much for your amazing presentation and your very extremely uh, interesting remarks. Um, if you don't mind, and if I may, uh, I would like to come back to the conflict ex itself and the terrifying uh, war that your country faced more than 10 years ago, um, more especially to the reason of this conflict. It would be, um, of course, reductionist uh, to say that the reasons of the conflict were uh, only cultural, but there was certainly a cultural part, uh, I mean, meaning by culture um, in, a large, in a large meaning, uh, religion, diversity, and uh, historical clashes between the communities. So I would be glad to get your expertise on that topic. Well, thanks a lot. I'm really grateful, and now I don't regret that I made it uh, and that I'm here for, for, for the sake of these, these questions that are uh, making me also reflect and then try to uh, respond as best as possible. Uh, now, I'm very happy that you mentioned uh, Romania and the way that you labeled that it is yet to recognize. That's kind of a very positive, very hopeful approach. We also try to approach it in that way. And in fact, really, what one misinterpretation that has been done frequently and is still being done is to claim that every single country that has not yet recognized Kosovo is kind of against recognition. I've studied that carefully and you see that simply different countries have different uh, rhythm of responding to requests for, for, for recognitions. And in our case, clearly we have no illusions. There are some who have, so who have a strong position against 
but the majority who still have not recognized are kind of indifferent or lack information or still have not made that decision and so on and so forth. In the case of Romania, still really has not been made a decision and position has been uh, not to recognize for the reasons like you have mentioned. I mean, that would foster uh, maybe secessionist movements and in fact, initially it was labeled as being against international law. Uh, the fact that we have had a ruling by International Court of Justice saying that that is not the case, uh, I think takes away that argument. Because with all due respects toward, towards any other country, uh, I mean, for me, what matters in interpreting international law is much more the saying of International Court of Justice than what one country, any country, says. That is the final word when it comes to international law. That is the final word that should be about international law rather than the country. So, if a country doesn't want to recognize for this or that reason, of course you cannot compel it. It is a sovereign right whether one country wants or not to recognize. But to claim that there are these, let's say, international law reasons when you have a very clear, extremely clear opinion of International Court of Justice really doesn't fly that well. Now, of course, we communicate with all uh, countries uh, who have not uh, recognized yet and uh, it, uh, dynamics differs from one to the other. Some are very open uh, and uh, some are more, uh, let's say, um, careful. I was talking earlier about diplomats being told and expected and paid to stick to the policy guidelines of their own bosses and countries. And many diplomats, of course, would not take that risk to meet with the other if they are not uh, supposed to. But nonetheless, even with Romania, I think that these arguments about secessionists, in full honesty, do not even do a service to those countries because cases are completely different. Uh, we have went through a breakup of our former federation. Uh, we have been at the receiving end of the attempted genocide. International community has intervened. We have always had, since the Second World War, distinct boundaries internally that has become international borders like with every other unit of former Yugoslavia. We have always been overwhelming majority, the will of people is there and so on and so forth. We have had an equal representation at the federal level in former Yugoslavia. So every single element that is there doesn't exist in the case of other movement. So really, this may not be too diplomatic to say, but for any country who kind of draws attention to its case and allows others to make a parallel between the treatment of Kosovars by Serbia and the treatment of their minorities from their capitals just don't, doesn't do very much service because you may have different issue, uh, issues in any country like, I don't know, uh, Spain or Romania or country that we are here in Belgium, but as long as you have democratic framework those issues are negotiated and that is what matters most importantly so you don't have to be afraid or terrified or draw false parallels. That's my point. When it comes to kind of cultural elements of the former conflict, I mean in our case well, I mean, there is extensive academic writing on that and my conviction is that particular religion didn't play absolutely actually no role. Um, and you may argue why and so on, but our ethnic identity, in the case of us Albanians as a majority in Kosovo, is, has always overshadowed other identities. We share three different religions, main religions, and of course there are others. So some are Muslims, some are um, Roman Catholics, others are Orthodox, and so on. And the consciousness, awareness of how we have converted, even those who have converted during the five centuries of Ottoman Empire to Islam is very vivid. We have the case a lot, even nowadays, of crypto-Catholics, of those who have kept one their name and their identity in the family, but then for the sake of, 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 um, of, of pressure during the Ottoman Empire, they declared other name and so on. So they kept these both identities. So in our case, that didn't play a role vis-a-vis let's say, an enemy and an apparatus that was already there for and with all other elements. So we didn't need an additional element to um, distinguish ourselves from or to fight it from. Uh, maybe in other countries when you had, you know, if you had common language or something, you need an element to, 
to divide, to distinguish yourself. But in our case, uh, unlike all other elements of former Yugoslavia who more or less would understand each other, uh, our, our, our language is also separate, it's completely independent in the family of Indo-European languages. Uh, so, 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 so kind of religion certainly did not uh, play, but of course uh, there was, there was um, let's say, gap in understanding. As I mentioned, language, uh, we learned and we studied, uh, were able to, let's say, speak the language of others uh, in the former Yugoslavia, but barely anybody could speak our own language because we were considered second-class citizens and there was no interest to, 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 to learn our language. Uh, so in that sense, I mean, these kind of cultural elements certainly have played a part because when you have that kind of gap, it was very easy for this machinery uh, of, of, of Belgrade to uh, generate any kind of uh, media campaign or stereotypes and so on, and to uh, use those kinds of campaigns for other more brutal military and armed campaigns. I hope this does service to a very, very uh, direct but complicated uh, question, which would require, of course, much more complicated uh, answers. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Let us take this uh, time to please express our gratitude once again to His Excellency, Ambassador Thank you.